have for opening the show. Um, welcome once again to another edition of the History Society. I'm very pleased to say that we are now in contemporary history. Um, my late stepfather, Bill Sutton, was a don from Oxford. He did his modern history degree uh, at, at Oxford, which started with Julius Caesar. <laughs> but he wasn't that old. <laughs> So we are now in the period of the 1990s, and Paul Skippers, who many I'm sure you know as a practicing architect of some standing in Gettenberg Bay, Paul was at the forefront of that transition, the delicate stage between the old regime and the new um, in the 1990s, and it's a, given the modern politics of which I have intimate acquaintance, it's very interesting to me, personally, to look back as to where we came from in Plitt in the modern era and say what happened in the 1990s and who better to tell us about that who was himself not only an eyewitness to those events but also for his sins a practicing mayor, your worship. <laughs> Emeritus, your worship Emeritus. It gives me great pleasure, therefore, to give to you Paul Skirpers, thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you can hear me. Am I talking right? Yes. That's good. Well, in the 1990s, Plato was going through trying times. So I'm going to tell you about some of the things that you may know and some of you may not know. But it's interesting and well, let's kick off with Kwanakatula. In those days, there was not a single house in Kwanakatula. There were only toilets. And then some smart-ass people in Plett put up a big sign on the N2, and they called it Flushing Meadows. <laughs> and that, following Mandela's dream of a better life for all, did not go down well with me. So, one day I had an idea and I put it to the council. On Beachy Head Road, our most expensive road in Plettenberg Bay, was a piece of public open space. So the idea I put to the council was, why don't we cut off 10 plots on that public open space, sell them, and kickstart Guanacatula? The council were not convinced and said, you must ask the ratepayers. So I wrote a personal letter to every single ratepayer in Plett, the municipality posted it. And you won't believe it, but we got a 90% positive written response. Mm. Oh. Mm. And with that, the council approved it, province approved it, but now we had a problem. This was late in the year, and if we wanted to sell that land in the season, we had to sell it in December. But that subdivision could only have come through in March or April. So I wrote to the Surveyor General of South Africa, who does all subdivisions, and explained our situation to him. He came back immediately and said, I support you 100%. Your application has moved to number one on the list. Mm. That subdivision happened in time. We had the auction was held in the season, and all the properties were sold. So, now, we got that and we've got it all done. Now, what do we do? Kwanakatula. <coughs> the housing department was in total chaos in South Africa. I mean, they had built these toilets and the, this vision that the people would build the houses around the toilets. It was never <laughs> going to happen. So. Nowadays, when you build RDP houses, they're working drawings, they're designs, they're engineers supervising it, everything, the houses are fully designed, specified. In there, those days, there was nothing. What do we do now? We're sitting in Kwano with a whole lot of toilets and nothing. So, what we kicked off with, we went and we built 10 show houses, invited various people to build it to give people the opportunity to pick what kind of house they would like and that we could check them out and see if they complied with any of the standards. 
And that worked quite well. And then we had Stockfelds. I don't know if you know what a Stockfeld is, but a group of black people get together, they pool all their money, and they build it as a, as a group. And that was worked out quite efficiently, and it actually did pretty well. <coughs> and we had some individuals that built their own houses and everything. And I must support the municipality at the time, the town engineer's department, the building control. Here they were working with new stuff out of the blue, and they supervised it, they checked it out, they ensured that the building lines were complied with. They did everything. And it, it was just wonderful what the, the department did. And then another hero in my book was Mark Furry Eastler at the municipality. You know, when you completed a house, we needed to get the subsidy paid out. But the housing departments were in such chaos, they wouldn't pay us out. So Mark used to drive to Cape Town and go and bully them to pay us out the subsidies for the houses complete. If he hadn't done that, the whole project would have stopped. But then there were other heroes here. There was Mike Wells. Now he wasn't involved in the council at all. He was just totally committed to the housing for our people. And he chaired a, a housing committee and then started the CDC, Community Development Center. Now this center was based uh, at Hillview Farm. They built warehouses, which the housing trust paid for, so that people could come and collect their building materials to build houses and everything like that. They brought in training officers from Cape Town to treat, teach unskilled people how to build houses. And then, very sad thing in my book, Mike Wells was so committed to this, and one day he travels to Europe to raise money for the CDC. He comes back at the next committee meeting, the guy said, well, you know, where you've each said I've been to Europe to raise money for the CDC. And they turned around and said, well, why didn't you take us with you? He said, but I paid for it out of my own pocket. They said, that's it, now dumped him as chairman. Oh. No. Anyway, needless to say, the CDC went belly up. And then to cut a long story short, let won the award for the best delivery of housing of any town in South Africa. The whole of South Africa built 200,000 houses, let had built 1,000. And Nasa hadn't built one. So that's it. Then when all the subsidies were paid out, the money was paid back to the Plettenberg Bay Housing Trust. And the trust went into social projects. They built a center for the mentally and physically disabled in Kranzhoek, because I went there one day, and these people were being cared for in a tiny little room at the back of the municipal offices. It was dreadful. Oh, sorry, what year are we up to now? We are now 92, 93. Thank you. They built <coughs> at Kranzhoek, and then we built a soup kitchen added on to that. In 2002, Witterdrift Green Valley community had no TV reception. So after a two-year fight with SABC, got permission to build a TV station. Casey Van Hastien gave us permission to build it on, his, on the hill on his farm at no charge. The power came from his farm. It cost us in 2000, 250,000 bucks, and we ran it for eight years. Another cost 150,000 rand. We paid for future planning. We provided office containers for schools, for libraries, and for whatever else. We built 10 houses in Kwanakatula for teachers coming in from the Eastern Cape, who had nowhere to stay. We built 10 houses in New Horizons for the physically disabled. And then one day, a lady which I'm sure many of you know, Edna Light, she came to me and there was a lady in Bosischof in the informal settlement. And out of her shack, she was making soup for the people around her who were hungry. And she asked me for a container to, to help her. So I had a look at this, and uh, it didn't work so well. But in the industrial area was a piece of land, which is quite a nice story. Someone donated it to the municipality on the condition that it was never sold. 
Now what the trust did, we built four little semi-industrial buildings which we're going to use for entrepreneurship, for people who wanted to start build businesses. Mm. You know, one of them was vacant and uh, I bullied the municipality into getting it. And we then fitted it out as a soup kitchen, fully fitted. It's been expanded now to a classroom for pre-school kids. And we built a shelter for people waiting behind. Do you know that that lady feeds 350 people five times a week? Still. 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 To this day. She travels overseas to raise money for this. And the donors, they come in every year and they come in with their cameras and they cannot believe what she's actually doing and what their money is doing. It is phenomenal. And they also feed the preschool kids in the little classroom we added on. Now what people don't realize, in those days, the police had two vehicles running in play. Rotary Ants donated them a car to add, to bring it to three. But they couldn't get it registered, so the trust paid for petrol for three months for them. Cell phones were just arriving in those days. The police and detectives had no communication. The aerials weren't working. Nothing was working. So the trust bought cell phones and airtime for the detectives and the police. Mm. We replaced... I mean, it's the detective branch, the fax machine broke. They, they couldn't get it fixed. So we replaced that for them. And I think the biggest thing here is that the rate payers of pledge should pat themselves on the back. None of this would have happened had they not given that 90% written response to sell that land on Beachhead Road. Without that, nothing would have happened. And I salute that. Now in those days, Pletch had a little tiny clinic behind the fire station. There were four rooms and a garage. There was a tiny little one in New Horizons another little one somewhere else and the council went to province and said listen we need a proper clinic for our people they came back and said we've got no money but if you build it we'll run it so the council wrote to all the ratepayers and asked for donations and there were a lot of donations made and a lot of people were very generous but percentage wise it wasn't nearly enough to to, to get anywhere. And then out of the blue, Donnie Gordon walked up to us and said, I will match you rand for rand. Wow, we were on our way. It was designed, went out to tender. It was built. It overran the price. He said, no problem. I'll still match you rand for rand. When the building was complete, we walked the family through the building and we said we'd like to call it the Donnie Gordon Clinic. And they said, no. what a gentleman. And you have no idea the difference that clinic made to the people of Pet. You know, some of you might recall Professor von Selm. I did a little addition onto that clinic. Now, he was an eye specialist. He did 3,000 cataract operations. There. The number of times I went in there, and the benches were full of people waiting from all races, everybody, anybody who couldn't afford to go to a doctor came there and got superb service. So many other doctors who came and retired to Plet all came and offered their services that that clinic was really something special. Then, now we start, I started off with a council of six councillors and then it changed. We move to the inter pre interim and interim council. That means my councils now move to 40. <coughs> now they couldn't fit in the council chamber anymore, so the council meetings were done in the community hall. And many of you may not know this, but in those days, Plett was in the Eastern Cape. The, oh. the boundary was the Garden of Eden. Oh. Oh. Anyway, so the demarcation board came up and they 
We're reviewing all the provincial boundaries. And our late LA town clerk, Alex Smart, wrote a magnificent motivation as to why Pletch should move from the Eastern Cape to the Western Cape. Now, you've got to understand those 40 councillors I had represented every political party, every organisation in Pletch, from all the political guys to the Rate Payers Association, to the Farmers Association, you name it, we represented. So it was the whole town, every single piece of it. They all read the motivation, all supported it 100%. I led a delegation to PE to the demarcation board. I presented the case. And later, they came back and they said to us that they'd never had an application from anybody of one community where it stood 100% behind the application. Yeah. So our boundary was moved from Carnabine to Blokhans, and we were in the Western Cape. You have no idea that the influence it's had on our town. I mean, housing, education, health, road systems, and just so much more. It just is so much better. The Eastern Cape's in a mess. We wouldn't have been forgotten. Now such, not such nice stuff. Huh? Inplet was a small community and they lived between New Horizons and the industrial area on the N2. And they were a very violent bunch of people. One day I had a horrible task. The ANC came to see me and they had heard they were going to have a meeting in Bosiskip at the school hall there. They had heard that this community were going to seal off the doors and attack the ANC through the windows. The ANC councillors informed me to tell their councillor that should that happen, all 40 members in that community will be killed. I had the lovely job of informing them, needless to say, it stopped. Nothing happened. Many factories were burnt down in the industrial area, and the police were not allowed to cross the N2 into the t only the ride squad from George could go through. We lived near the fire department and the number of times in the middle of the night the sirens used to go off, I used to go down because the volunteers and the firemen were out fighting the fires and the single lady stayed behind and she was quite scared so I just kept her company there. And these guys were heroes. They weren't safe, they went out, they fought the fires, they put them out. They were magnificent. And then the violence continued. One of my counselors, a guy called Rene Tapp, a real, real gentleman, a full time job in the industrial area, took time off work to attend every committee, every meeting, doing what's right for his people. One weekend he was murdered. Killers never bought a book. There have been rumors, but no one knows that. And then one day, at an ANC meeting in Bosischiff, a young lady stood up and said something that a specific, specific <coughs> ANC guy didn't like, and he got some young guys to grab her out. They stripped her naked and chased her through Bosischiff naked because of what she said. At the next meeting, <coughs> a crippled barman who worked at the hotel next door on N2 I call Nelson Maseko. He stood up at the ANC meeting and he said what the ANC did was totally unacceptable. This is not the way the ANC should conduct themselves. The next morning, in full daylight, in front of everybody, he was chopped to death. No one, everyone knows who did it or organized it. <coughs> everybody was just too terrified to say a word because the same would happen to them. He was the first man to die standing up for women's rights in bed. And what's quite sad for me is there were others too. There was, I think the, one of our ex-mayor's brothers with police fired bird shot at, at a group of people and one pellet went in behind his ear and killed him, which is a rare thing. It shouldn't have happened. But there were other guys who died. 
in South Africa, you know, we have Heritage Day. There's not a memorial. There's nothing. Just thinking about these guys. And then violence continued. One day in the country club, a lady golfers were held up and robbed. One Saturday afternoon, the word went out that the country club was going to be attacked <coughs> and the golfers shot. Now this happened in the Eastern Cape where golfers were shot. That Saturday there were so many police dressed up in golf gear, all armed, <coughs> waiting for it to happen. Lucky it didn't happen. Russ Victor was a captain of the country club and I was his vice captain. One day we were informed that that violent bunch were going to burn down the country club. So Russ and I went and stayed there late into the night, ready to defend our club. And we stayed there late and then nothing happened. The next day I had heard that some people had arrived. There were two strange cars parked in the car park that should not have been there. They abandoned the mission. Okay. Then one Saturday afternoon, I was playing golf and on the fourth fairway, and I, I was grabbed off the course. All the senior municipal officials were out of town, and there's been a bomb threat to blow up the Beacon Island Hotel. So, what we had to do is put the town on standby. The fire brigade were on standby around the corner from the BI. The NSRI were on standby, the clinic, all the doctors were on standby, the municipal staff were on standby, the doctors, everybody, and as I say, the bomb squad from George came in and luckily they searched the hotel and nothing was found. One weekend, uh, the ANC warned us that that group of people were going to attack me and my family at our house. So I sent two of my two daughters to stay with Tom and Dicey in, Dicey in Uplands, spent the weekend with them. I stayed behind. Luckily nothing happened. Then a little bit of light release. I ended up having to sit at a peace committee meeting. And there they brought in specialist guys to help and we had everybody from the police to the political parties, everyone, just to try and bring priests to bed. Now our cops were not allowed, not allowed to cross the N2 into the industrial area. So what happens is the guys in the industrial area you should throw stones at the police on the road. So the police got the hell in and started shooting back with catties. <laughs> now that was fine, but at, at the meet at the peace committee meeting it came up that some of the police started firing spark plugs, not stones. And the re resolution was taken that stones were acceptable, but spark plugs were not. <laughs> now for something a little bit different. Around about 2000, the Plettenberg, you might recall, our fishing industry was doing very well. And two of our councillors, who weren't fishermen, and five others who also weren't fishermen formed the Plettenberg Bay Fishermen's Trust. This was a trust to support the poor people in times of need. Because they represented them, they applied to the Department of Fisheries for a fishing quota. And they were given a 52.1 ton hay quota. <coughs> Then they came and they joined up with another local guy and they started a company and he owned 45% of the shares and the trust owned 55. And then he was put under quite a lot of pressure by the trustees to sell his shares in that company. I contacted him a couple of times and asked for information. He would never say a word. Anyway, he was forced to sell and he sold all his shares to the Christie's in Cape St. Francis. So, to this day, the beneficiaries have not received one single cent from the trust. You know, I contacted the accountants 
And they told me, the monies which have been declared as dividends to the trust have been allocated to the trustees who are mandated to allocate them as per the trust document. The trustees would not give the beneficiaries a copy of the trust document. The housing trust got involved and it cost us 10,000 Rand to get someone to go to have a lawyer involved and go all the way to the master of the Supreme Court in Cape Town to get a copy of the document. They wouldn't give them any other financial statements. So two years ago, um, personal reasons, I gave all my documents over to Cornelius Kricher, a beneficiary from New Horizons. He's had meetings with the beneficiaries. He's got all their names, everything. They're following it up. <coughs> but they've got no money, these people. So whether they get anywhere or not, I don't know. But it's rather sad for me. And something a little bit better. In those days, the Lookout Beach had a little kiosk there. And one day the council thought, well, it would be really nice to have a, a restaurant here. Man, did the rate base go ballistic. They formed a petition against us. <laughs> but then another petition was made in favor of it. And then I had a meeting with the town clerk, and he said to me, let's dump it. I said, no, this will be an asset to plant. Went away, went out to tender, two tenders, Chris Struber won it, he built it. Guess who became his most loyal supporters? The guys who signed the objection. <laughs> <laughs> now behind that is a little place called the Whale Tail. This is a place where you can have the most beautiful view of our bay. And when I wanted to build that, I had a little bit of flack from the local people, because they didn't want cars around there. This was their property sort of thing. We went ahead and we built it. And it's really been a great success. It's been very well used and so many people use it. And uh, I often listen to Alice here radio. Behind every dark cloud is a silver line. Another that I heard after elke donker, donker wolk is daar <laughs> <laughs> So that's it. <laughs> amazing, Paul. Absolutely amazing. Now, uh, questions? Yeah, any questions? At the back? Yeah, um, Paul, thanks for that. It was most enlightening. I just wanted to find out from you in your living memory, when you talk about pressure that was put on the Christie, by the Christie brothers on the existing... No, no. It was the trustees. Sorry, it was the trustees who put, put pressure on that guy to sell. Um, do you have any idea what the nature of the pressure was? Well, I would have guessed that perhaps the Christies put pressure on them to, that they wanted to buy it. What was the nature of the pressure? Was it intimidatory or tactics? Or give me an idea? I, I don't know. As I say, this gentleman would say nothing to me. He would not say a word. I think he was quite terrified. <laughs> More questions? Paul, um, for those of us who are perhaps a bit doff. <laughs> no, you're talking well, about yourself you, there. Yeah, yeah, I am. <laughs> that's why I'm asking the question. Uh, all the burnings and the destruction of property at the time what from what you have what you knew and what you found out about it what were they hoping to achieve who was hoping to achieve anything from all of that are we not you know d let's not take too much for granted about how much we know about that my understanding is that it it was that small group of people i don't believe it was an ANC en masse. I think it was a small group of people perhaps trying to get power. And they were trying to be seen as, a, as, as the new leaders or whatever. I think that was the idea. But I don't think the community bought it. But it was, I believe, that small community. So I, I don't believe it was the ANC in general, no. More questions? Um, sorry, Paul, uh, excuse my ignorance, but before the changeover, uh, which political party was in control of the council here? 
there was no political party. Because we're all independent. Oh. Okay. So that was lucky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any more? Paul, uh, were you still around when the lookout uh, park was, when the reserve was planned around the lookout deck? I recall that, but I don't, can't recall the detail. Sorry, Paul. Okay. Yeah. If I may intervene, for the benefit of the, of the members, what actually happened, I got a brief from L.B. Palmer or L.B. Berger, whichever you prefer. The effective deal that was struck at the time by the, the, the local landowners adjacent to that particular restaurant was that they would donate some money to a trust for the furtherance of that reserve on condition that their view of the sea, as it were, was undisturbed. It was a kind of a really nice win-win situation that was struck. Yeah. I was involved this time last year in a meeting of around security when a tourist was mugged on that trail. And everybody and their mother was represented at that meeting, where it was agreed that this reserve ought to be furthered. Now, I'm glad that Marietta herself <coughs> asked the question because of her involvement in Peter 10 now Beto 11, because one of the stipulations of the deal that was struck is that that money would be released specifically for the furtherance of those 11 schools. So it's a third win situation. So my argument has been, and I trust that rapers, since they're represented here some, uh, will take this matter forward, is that it's vitally important, even for the cultural uh, agenda of Plettenberg Bay residents, that this issue of the reserve is, is, is fixed not only for security reasons, but also for the benefit of that reserve, which does have an environmental management plan. And I think that we as History Society, I would beg our, both our committee members and <coughs> our, our members to in fact support this initiative, because it cannot be anything else but university, university approved as a plan. It just simply has to be implemented. All that has to take place so that the money can be released for a future Well, I would suggest you talk to the council. Been there, done that. Any more so questions? Many <laughs> One more. <coughs> you, you mentioned a school in Bosischif, and I know that that's definitely not a government school. I do know that there was a little building where Andrew Smith and Rosemary Murray offered remedial help many years ago. But I'd just like to know, um, I know that you were the mayor as well, do you have any further info about the school that they had in Bosisco? Because I know that there's no roads down there in Bosisco. Well, I don't know which school, the little, tiny little school is just a preschool thing, but that's in the industrial area. That was adjoining the soup kitchen. That was one of the little factories. <coughs> when it became vacant, we grabbed it and turned it into a classroom for preschool kids. So it's run by, run by them. And they feed the kids as well. Um, around the time when the, the regime was changed, there were so many people that were doing fantastic work, mm -hmm. like you're saying. Um, but there are, there's not much done about them, as, as you were also referring to. Uh, but there were people like Rosemary Murray Absolutely. and um, Jean Spock and uh, uh, Carol Sachs, who were working, uh, and I know a lot of others, <coughs> but I know them, <coughs> were working in the townships and were working and doing such good work, mm -hmm. mentoring people and doing workshops for people who are traumatized and stuff like that. And nobody ever talks about that. Yeah. And I, I missed it in your talk as well. You know, the people who were in the community working with them, and there was really good work <coughs> done then. Well, you're quite right, but that list is huge. Yes. The people from all sectors, people rose to make a better life for all. And so many people from all sets, you know, Rotary, everybody got involved, everyone that did everything, there were just so many of them. I would be here all night if I had to list their names. There were just so many. It was wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, Borsi's Cliff is a dreadful name, and I went in to find out where it came from. It came from a combination of Bosman's Gift. Yes. Now, who is Bosman, and where did this come in? Bosman. I have no idea. Does anyone know? Paul, I will like to endorse that sentiment. I think the name is poisonous. Yes, it is. If you'll pardon the pun. To call an area, albeit informal housing, whatever, Bossy's Chiff, it's poison. Why is that area called that? Okay, it's all very well to say, oh, Disney Folksmont. You know what I mean? It, it's common knowledge, that's what it's called. I think it's absolutely appalling, and the connotation of the name is dreadful. Yes. So the connotation is dreadful, but the name itself came from Bosman's gift. Yeah, I know, I but know now it, but it's become, it become the poison out of the bush. <laughs> Bossy's gift. It, it got nothing to do with Bossman or gift. So what are we going to do about it? We should start, we should do something to lobby somebody, our council or municipality or whatever, to do something about it. It's a shocking name. It has another But nobody knows the other name. Yeah, peep, now, have we, have we in this meeting now used the name Kolweni? But, you know, Basil has just said, no, it's actually called Kolweni. We have now only used the name Bossy's Schiff. Nobody mentioned Kolweni before. Sorry, there's a comment at the back there. Uh, yes, um, information that has been passed on to me via my family. We, we live in Plekt all the years and we live in, in New Horizons right now and we've been working a lot with the Borsi Schiff people. Um, and the info that we received was that it was church ground and from the word bishop's gift, which the so-called colored and black no, people could not pronounce, the word became Borsi Schiff. That is the information we received. So, so I'm just mentioning it under correction. Michael? No. 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 I think this is a really good thing for the History Society to take up because one of the historical, I suppose, objectives is the naming of places and the correct naming of, and also of people. And I think that, for me, it reminds me so much of the Onrus Tea Party where the local people liked the name of Onrust, which is the old Dutch name, and they kept the government kept putting up the word on risk and then they would paint a T on the back of the name. Could we not suggest through the proper authorities that Bossy's Chiff we go back to being Bossy's Gift with a T? Bishop. And whether it's Bosman or whether it's the Bishop, we can find out through research. But I think it's vitally important that some kind of, and I agree totally with the speaker, that some kind of dignity be restored to that community. Yeah, yeah. yeah I yeah. think, firstly, I think what must understand we have to deal directly with the people who are living in that yes. vicinity. Yeah. 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 We can't go and impose what we believe is correct on them. Do you think they are happy with that name? Well, I think you have to ask them. Yeah. Because Maybe a lot of people are used to that. Maybe we should. <laughs> Paul, I think we've got to look at the past, you know. And you've certainly, you've hit the nail on the head. We've got to speak to the people of Bossy Schiff. Great. Maybe for some reason they want to keep that name. Perhaps so. They yes. want to keep that name. And you'll remember that when we established Kwanakatula, we established Kwanakatula, we said we wanted a 30 meter a wooded a section Three. area between Kwanakatula and the road, yep. the N2. They said, You're trying to hide us. <laughs> We're going to build our houses right on the road. And we've got to be careful about the attitudes going way back and consult with the people before we make any decisions. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Can anybody tell us what Kwanokatula means? I speak Kosa. I, I have it as one of my studied languages. We've grown up with Kosa. I was born in Transkai. I've never heard a satisfactory translation of Kwano Kutula. I know Tula means to be quiet, quiet. Kwano Kutula. 
Can anybody place say my what it actually yes. means? Place Does it mean the place of silence? Yes. The place yes. where you shut up? No, the place of silence. No. Ogutula means to shut up. Ogutula is the infinitive noun for silence. Be quiet. No, no not be quiet. Silence. Tula is a verb. Nokutula, ukutula is silence. Okay. Yes. A place silence. of silence. Kwano means at the place of. So at yeah. the place of silence or simply the place of silence. The place okay. of quiet, the place of tranquility. Thank you, Mike. You've yeah. said it. Mike. Well done. <laughs> because I know you are a student of Kosa. <laughs> Any more questions? I would like to see that goodwill that was there then. Yeah, yeah. Now that we have a, another uh, president who seems to be on the positive road, yeah, yeah. I would like to see that goodwill come out again. Mm -hmm. Because I am so tired of looking at the poverty and the bad uh, education that's going on in, that, in, in those uh, suburbs and all the wealth that's going on here. And there's no speaking, there's no, no goodwill, there's mm -hmm. nothing. I and think you must just be patient. Just like <laughs> you know, Angus Buchan had a prayer service in the Free State near Bloemfontein. 1.2 million people went to pray for South Africa. Mm. The Lord heard us, we are on our way up. Yeah, yeah. And we're on our way. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Paul, um, I think for all of us, it was an amazing talk. Okay, we learned, I certainly learned a great deal. Okay, and I'm sure that the people here do. Because we've been coming to Plettenberg Bay area for the last 60 years, so... Um, I've learned a lot tonight, so thank you very much for it. Yeah, yeah. You. Well done. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah.